Um, but thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see the people are coming back and some new guys as well. Um, so I'm Dan. I do all the computer forensic work here at Vincent's, which I uh, look at that. So if you've been to a few seminars before, they normally have a caricature, which they got done by some guy in Singapore or something. I think they're terrible. All year I've been railing against these caricatures. I think they're so stupid. Uh, so they put that up. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> what great marketing stuff we do have. So um, my background is as a chartered accountant, and I started working at Vincent's um, in 2002 when we were all forensics focused. Um, doing valuations and doing uh, economic loss reports. But back then, um, we started to see most matters in terms of investigations and fraud always involve the computer. And we were going out to ex-AFP offices and, and relying on other people to do computer forensic work to find accounting files for us, to find log files or deleted um, spreadsheets and things like that. And they were charging sort of telephone number type B. So we thought if those guys can do it, surely we could do it. <laughs> So just getting trained up in computer forensics and uh, now that's pretty much, that is all I do mainly. But I still work with John and Peter in, in family law type matters as well. So um, so that's me as a background. I started doing computer forensics in about 2007 when it was still a bit of a, a bit of a dark science. Um, but now it's a lot more out there in terms of people understand what deleted files are and perhaps things aren't as deleted as they you think they are and, and what can you recover and what can't you and, and why you might use computer forensics. Um, and I'm happy to just to, if you guys say, oh, I've got a matter where this happened or that happened, just as we go along. And that's why I, I like doing a smaller group so that we can just, just talk about things for now. But what I thought I'd do, I don't know if anyone has used computer forensics before or had cause to, to use it in a matter. Um, or you said you won't be doing computer forensics yourself, so it's not a how-to. <laughs> guy, as John likes to do with accounting, how to do accounting. Um, it's more just, here's what we do, here's why we do it, here's what you can benefit from, and, and, and there's a lot of managing the communication with clients where it's not magic. <clears throat> and they say, oh, someone told me that my husband or my ex-wife or whatever can do this, this, and this. Is that right? Um, and no, that's not right. And if they ever looked at a picture or something on this computer, can you get it back? Maybe. Maybe not. So it's, it's not just um, saying people, we can do anything with a computer. It's not the case. It, it, there is much more of a analytical uh, view to, to this type of thing. So that's a, a lot of what I do with clients is managing that expectation. What, what was NCASE? NCASE is sort of the industry standard. Um, again, because a lot of this stuff is still in the formative stage, NCASE was something, some code that someone wrote back in the early 90s to recover deleted files from PCs. And it used to be called WinHex. And it literally read um, the dots and dashes on a hard drive and reconstructed deleted files. And people thought this was magic. That then got developed and taken over and sold and back and forth and more investment. Now a program called NCASE. And that's the sort of the, one of the industry standard bits of software. Um, a lot of this stuff comes out of America because they, in terms of their, they do so much litigation and everything's tested and tested and tested, especially by people like the FBI and stuff like that. So the one that the FBI uses, everyone jumps on that because they rely on that so much and they test things so rigorously. So, so I'm trained in NCASE as, a, as an NCASE um, certified examiner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what we just talked about, what's computer forensic? <coughs> how do we adopt computer forensic? how um, it works, how perhaps uh, practitioners or family law practitioners might um, benefit from it. Um, there's a little bit, because I always get these sessions, what do I do if I get hacked or how can I protect myself? I just put a section there for that as well. And a quick chat about some, some case studies. So, uh, we'll jump in. So I've had this slide since about 2007 and it hasn't changed at all. So as a computer forensic expert, um, my role is uh, to acquire, analyze, and preserve digital evidence in a manner that I can go to court and provide independent expert testimony. So that's, it's not being a magician and just magically coming up with stuff and giving that to clients. Obviously, if, you, if you're engaging an expert, it's got to be court admissible and, and there's got to be some science behind it and backed up by, uh, you know, facts and your state assumptions, all that type of thing. So, 
um, identify the devices. It used to just be a big PC tower on someone's desk or, or a big brick laptop. And that, for a while now, has not been the case. Most matters I do now, we would have a phone. In fact, every matter I do now, there'll be a phone, which is now just a PC in your pocket, computer in your pocket. Um, some USBs, um, a backup disk, uh, and an online account that we can acquire uh, forensically as well. Uh, the Google the Drive, SkyDrive, all that type of thing. It's no longer just the, uh, the floppy disk or the computer, which is what it used to be. Is when you, we were talking earlier about NCase and WinPex, it was just how do we accidentally delete a file? How do we get it back? I haven't got a backup in that with WinPex to recover it. So back in the day, everyone had a PC, a Windows PC clone running XP. So that was the the absolute. You walk into every office, it was an accounting office or a law firm you'd have 100 people with the exact same PC. And so all the investment was on programs that could recover PC files. Um, it's fantastic. And that was the golden age of computer forensics. Because we knew what we could do, you'd walk into a job, it was going to be a computer with a four gigabyte hard drive, or maybe a massive 20 gigabyte hard drive. Um, maybe the director, like, you know, the senior guy would have a 20 gig hard drive, <clears throat> and you do all your analysis. You know exactly what you're going to get. But now we've got Android phones, Apple devices, Macs, on, online, uh, dummy terminals, all that type of thing. So it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, that's why I'm so important. <laughs> it's so complicated. It's not a complicated. It's not a complicated. Uh, um, so what is digital evidence? Um, that's what I just talked about. Um, even down to, you've probably seen articles on this. I did a paper on this. So years ago that um, got picked up by a few media outlets. Uh, people don't realise that your digital photocopy has a hard drive as well. Your digital photocopy has a little computer in it. And it, it actually saves, by default, most digital photocopies save all your print shops. They're all sitting on there. And that's how you can do duplexing and, and um, it uh, emails you, you know, emails you the print job, all that sort of thing. That's because it's, it's got a little hard drive in it. And so we've done a couple of jobs where we've gone into a professional office, medical office, um, imaged the hard drive in the photocopier and seen the law student copying the university notes and charging clients or stealing um, um, precedent documents so that they go to their next job because you have to put in the code and uh, we know it was them. Have you given anyone your code? No. So this job is on your code, charge this client, that type of thing. So that happens as well. So photocopy your phone, <clears throat> um, most of the things, in fact, everything that I talk about today is equally applicable to phones. There's a huge investment now because everyone has a phone. There's a huge investment in a phone forensic, cell phone forensic. There's some people that just do phone forensic. So, um, yeah. I wonder if the copy of hard drive be big enough capacity wise. To yeah. Use. Yeah. Because storage is so cheap now. They were saying we used to go to offices and they'd have a full gig hard drive, and you might recover some documents from this full gig, full gig hard drive because that was enormous. People couldn't fathom how big four gigabytes was. And there used to be like stats: oh, four gigabytes. If you if you printed out all the documents on a four gigabyte hard drive, it would fill a, a 32 floor high rise you know, paper. And now we've got 20 petabytes of information sitting in server farms all around the world. Storage is cheap. So, yeah, that's, that's massive. So, how do we do it? This is, these are the basic principles of how we do, and it's really good to understand these things. So, that, again, when you're talking to clients, if they say to you, what can we do, this, this might help. So, just think of a hard drive, a flash, a USB, or a hard drive on your computer, or even the cloud, as just a, a big catalogue. Um, and computers are dumb. They don't know where things are unless they keep a record of it. So if they lose track, if they lose their index, the file's gone. And that's when you get that little icon saying, I can't find that file. It's not where I thought it was. Because you either change the name of it or something, something's happened. So if you think of, uh, remember, the old, remember a library? If you think of a library, remember back in the day when you had a card file at the entrance of the library and you didn't walk around every shelf and try and find your book? That would take hours. You just went to the index by author or by title, 
it'll tell you where your book was. Your book's in um, aisle six, row nine, and then you go there and there's your book. That's how a computer works. It goes to the index, where's that file? Then goes to the file and reads it for you and presents it for you as a letter. So there's your index at the top. So file one, file two, file three. And in file one, in the index, it would say file one is at row two, line one. Uh, it's three blocks long. It's called file one. It's a dot doc, that type of thing. File two, file three. So, and it's not a scale, as we say. Uh, that's that's essentially like a snapshot. If you took a photo of the hard drive, that's sort of what it would look like. A whole bunch of blocks with an index. Um, and the other thing is. Um, Files are never stored all together. It's a, it's a random access system. So there's, there would, if file one, for example, there'd be half a block here, two and a half blocks here, and the, the end of the file might be up here. It's, it's all over the place. Uh, but anyway, don't worry about it. So, there's, so we call them active files. That, those are the active files. So when you go on your computer and you see my computer and your document, they're the active files. So not deleted. Um, so what happens is, file two, we hit delete, we don't need file two anymore. So it's now um, deleted, file two, but obviously file one and file three are still there. Um, and file one and file two, file three. But there's a gap where file two was. So if we can look at that entry, which is still there, there's just a little flag saying, file two is deleted, that space is available to me, the computer, um, if I need it, I, I can write, Files there if I need to, but you can imagine if, he, if, if the computer had to go to the file, scrub it out, make sure it was gone, come back, move everything up, change the file index table, it would just take ages. And what we want out of a computer is speed. Every, I mean, if computers weren't as fast as they were, we wouldn't be using them today. So uh, it just says tick delete it done. Um, so you can see if someone like me comes along at this point, takes a photograph of the computer, I can see file two and I can just say to my NK software, just show me the deleted file. It goes, here's one, and pulls it out and gives it to you. There's your deleted file. And it was in, it was, it was called file two, it was in this position, and that's how it is, that's how it works. So what we do is we take a snapshot of the computer and we call that a forensic image. So we take an image of the computer hard drive, we run external software over the image, not over the original evidence, the computer. That goes back to the client. We don't need to keep their laptop until the trial. We image it and then we give it straight back, or the phone, or the USB, whatever. And then we've got a read-only verified image of the computer. And that's, that's what happens. That's basically, that's 95% of computer forensics is just that. Analyzing and recovering, deleting, I beg your pardon, deleting. Finding deleting files, finding deleted files, and that's sort of, that's the process. So the old process of defragging the mm. hard drive, mm. what would that do to the file system? Yeah, so defragging used to be important when you had the four gig hard drive. All you had was four gigabytes. Yeah. Um, so you had the old so it, was, it was it was about efficiency. It was making sure that files weren't completely everywhere and and processes being slow back then took them a long time to piece the file back together to give it to you. So it tried to keep all the files together. So it would move files up and overwrite that. Right. So it would, it, would, it would pick up file three or a fragment of file three, for example, put it there so it was all together. So back then that would have caused issues. Yeah, back then it did, yeah, right. But no longer because most people would have a 128 gig or a, or a terabyte hard drive, which is vast and you don't need to do like most people now um, would would uh, click on you know defrag a hard drive and the computer would say you don't need to do this it's zero percent fragmented because super fast processing lots of space don't need to um, and even if it does defrag it there's so much space that it's even highly unlikely that it would override that because there's, it, there's so much space like it's massive um, yeah I remember yeah like defragging like yeah. Much younger and it would take hours. Yeah, but you don't need to do it now. You never see it now. Uh, the other thing is with um, solid state drives now, um, they tend to be moving stuff around all the time anyway. They're constantly moving things around because solid state drives are a USB 
So on your on your Mac or most PCs now have a solid state disk. So instead of the spinning platters that we used to have, it's just um, solid state memory. Like a big most hard drives now are just like a big USB, and they have protocols where they the sectors on a solid state disk only work so many times. I think it's like two billion times they can write and put things there. So they don't want to have a file there that they're constantly reading and writing to. You. Eventually those sectors will fail. So it moves files around all the time. It's called wear leveling. So that the disk is, is getting even wear all the time. Now that's a, that's a bit like defragging. So solid state disk are sort of moving on this whole recovery process to a different issue. So, anyway, you don't need to worry about that. Uh, no, they're impressive little pants to throw out there. So we can recover fault too, and that's what we do. Um, especially in things like um, acrimonious departure of an employee or a, or a business uh, business deal gone bad, where they've tried to delete things, um, we can recover. And sort of the sooner the better, effectively. Um, but with a massive hard drive, we'd almost always recover deleted files. They just don't need to overwrite them. So this is overwriting. So file four you can see is now on the top of file two. And this is when I say to clients that file is no longer there. And they go, oh no, 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 it was there. I know, I saw it on his screen. He must have deleted it. I say, yeah, well, perhaps it was, but it's no longer recoverable. Oh yeah, you're an idiot. But this is what happens is that they get overwritten. So we know file two is there. We can actually still read that index. The index entry is still there, and we can say there was a file to you, and it was called this, and it was in this position on the hard drive. But even my forensic software will say deleted, overwritten, non recoverable, but there was a file there. So all, the, all I do then is go to the shelf, grab the backup disk, and I say, and here it is. Um, so I've done plenty of warrants where guys have um, downloaded uh, movies or, or recorded heaps of movies on their phone or their computer. And for the purposes of overwriting, overwriting evidence without the appearance of doing anything bad, without throwing the computer in the ocean or saying, oh, no, 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 I've drilled a hole through it. It just says, oh, no, no, I just, I just have a big movie collection. And it overwrites things. I just reach over the shoulder, grab the backup disk off the shelf and say, oh, thanks very much. You'll have that. And it's all there. <coughs> so the statistics are there's on average like 14 copies of every email in the world because there's one on your computer, there's one on the server at your work. There's, there's a temporary, very temporary copy in the cloud or on your ISP. There's, there's six copies on your um, IT manager's backup, on all the tapes that they back up every day. So it's very hard to delete things. Did you want to leave? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be back. Yeah. If you delete an email from your computer, it's still on the server at your work. They've got a copy of it. So that's good. So that's how that's computer rents. So there you go. Any worries? Any problems? So you can see how I've got to manage that with clients. So look, yes, it was there, but it's not now. Or here it is. So that's good. Not magic. And we're talking about perfect copies. So when I image that hard drive, um, it's I start at the very first sector or, or, or byte on the hard drive and I image it right to the end. So I'm not just getting the active files, the things you see in your doc in your my documents, I'm getting the deleted stuff. I'm getting all the metadata of the files. So um, the operating system gives things like a, a date it was created, a date it was um, last accessed, a date it was last saved. I get all of that as well. Um, and the benefits of that are search. So give me all the things, give me all the files that were created on this date. So the, perhaps the date someone left or the date um, ex-husband um, deleted all the business records, that type of thing, or the spreadsheets. So that's, we can search by the metadata. So, so your Google search history is exactly like deleted files, although you will send clear browser history. Yep. There's still records of that as well. Yeah, to a point. Yep. Yeah. So it depends on how many obstacles are in our way. So deleting is not is an obstacle. Uh, formatting a drive is another big obstacle. Reinstalling Windows, massive obstacle. So the more obstacles are placed in our path, the less likely we are to get this stuff back. But we don't know until we look. So we, we, the first thing we always do is don't touch the computer, just image the hard drive and then go and see what we've got. We, we would never say, oh yeah, we'll get everything back. Oh yeah, it's fine. No, you can't delete anything. That's not the case. You can delete things. Um, but it's just, there's degrees. And sometimes we get partial recovery as well. You can get half an image 
or, or a spreadsheet that's slightly corrupt, you can still see some of the data. So there's levels of recovery as well. So um, when you right click, copy and paste, you, you get just the active file. You, you change the metadata of the file when you paste it onto your computer, things like date, creation date, last access date, modification date. So it's not the same file anymore. Although the content of a letter will look the same or a PDF, we couldn't, I can go to court and say this is that file because it's it's changed. So that's why we do the forensic news. But when we do something, it's it's read only. It can never change. Once we once we take that image, it can't be tampered with. There's security um, redundancy built into the image. So if any any uh, tiny bit was to be changed or tampered with, the image won't work anymore. It, it collapses. So there's safeguards built in, and that protects everybody. Um, and we get everything, all the relevant stuff, non-relevant stuff. Um, if, if that, does that mean you've got to take more than one copy yourself? Because if someone tampered with that one that you had, you can't go back and image what was on the day that you first took. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, you get a once and for all image, and you, we take that, and we then have redundancy built into our system. So we have uh, the primary copy, we have an evidence backup, and then we have our working evidence. Always copies of it, but they are all exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And if there's any doubt, there's a process to verify. You click verify, and it'll go. It runs through the file and, and takes what we call a hash, which is like a digital signature. And then you compare that signature to your original, and then they've got to be the same. They will be the same. And you actually have to get the hands on the physical computer to do a lot of this stuff. Uh, for speed and for verification, yes, that's best practice. Yeah. Um, we do do things online, but it's it's slower. It's um, you don't really know what you're imaging because you're not there. But we have done that. We do triage things. So if someone says, "Do you think you can get this email back?" We can um, set up an ID, so we can log in, set up a remote connection, grab some of the files, and say, "Look, that's not there." But if, if you want to go deeper, we'll come out and take an image if you can't find it. Yeah. Um, so here's me. <laughs> that photo came out all right. This is a while ago, imaging a computer. So this was a, um, a business where the husband and wife had separated or split. And they were fighting over the business. And the husband did his own valuation. He produced some spreadsheets and said, here are the, here are the um, membership numbers of the gym. And, and it was uh, you know, obviously low-balling it. So because obviously she was a, a, an owner of the business, we got access to the computer. And we went in, imaged it, and found where he'd taken the actual gym membership numbers and deleted a whole bunch of things. And it was changing records, and, and so we redid the valuation based on the real numbers and went, you know, presented that to him and said, Here's the original, here's the one you changed. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. So, um, obviously, it's modeling. <laughs> and that, just an example. I'm going to tell you about all my wins, not the ones where we go. I find it. Uh, so that's his computer, that's the target computer. You can just, I don't know if you can see that thing sticking out there. That's the hard drive. So computers are mostly air. See how that's just all air? It's not the case. Um, there's the hard drive. That's what we call a write blocker. So that's my write blocker. So the computer doesn't know that it's been even turned on or accessed because this little device um, just tells the computer, you're not turned on. But we turn it on. And then we image it. So the data can only go one way. It can only go from here through the right blocker and onto my computer. And that's the software that will take the image. And if it's if that's a 500 gigabyte hard drive, when we take the image, you can actually compress it down. So it might only be 50 gig, the actual evidence. It compresses. So anything that's a, a blank space, it just compresses it down. So it's really portable. If I can give my friend's image to another expert and say, well, here's the image that we have, and they can do analysis and come up with the same answer. It's very portable. Whereas if you give financial statements to another account, they'll probably come up with a different answer, you know, a different cap rate or different earnings. Or, so that's, that was a good, good one. I don't know what that is. is that, uh, yeah, I don't know. Everyone was out splitting up. I don't know. I think they were cleaning the windows. <laughs> but I didn't notice it. Some people, I started doing a session, people go, what's that? Some, some that's why they don't all big. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's like. Yeah, doesn't work. Yeah. Maybe it's going to wash, wash everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what typically we would always get. This photo is probably good. Okay. So that, that was a PC, Windows PC. So with the laptop, all of that air is just collapsed. So with the laptop, you just get the hard drive and everything all compressed in. And um, with, with a solid state disk out, um, you know, 
my this this phone would have more more space than that hard drive probably. That was the old spinning platters. Yeah. So sorry, I have a question yeah, right, yeah. about. When we're talking to clients and we say that there's an option available, yep. we always need to do a cost benefit analysis. Yeah. In that situation, your cost versus what she got out of it, do you have any idea? So she, so um, our costs haven't really changed because um, as we get faster, imaging speeds get faster and processes get quicker, so we don't have to be there as long. Hard drives get bigger. So we have to then image bigger hard drives. So things come and go, but um, I think the husband who valued the business at nil, we valued it at I think a couple hundred for this gym, maybe 150 plus equipment. Um, so she was able to argue that position. Yeah. And I think our report would have probably cost four or five grand okay. to get out there, image everything, store it, analyze it, come find all the stuff. And then um, and you generate a written report. Oh, absolutely, yep. Yeah. So we can, if it's a deleted file, we'll recover it, present it, we can give electronic copies. And as I said, it's all um, step through methodology. Here's what we did. Here's a copy of the image, we can make that available. Um, so yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not gonna apply always, absolutely. So yeah, you, you sort of have to think about that yourself, I guess. <laughs> um, but I'm always happy to talk, talk about stuff. Um, and I mentioned metadata already, so it's just the data about the data. So if you think of a letter, the metadata would be what date was created, um, last save, last access. Then that's from, so Windows gives you those types of dates, but um, the, the application software will give you metadata as well. You probably all use that, so who the author of it was, when was it last printed, when was it last edited, when was it last saved, um, all that type of thing. Are there any hidden um, codes in there? All that type of thing. So that's the metadata, data about the data. I've warned clients about that for documents, even yep. trust resolutions. Yep. You've got a Word file and its property says it was in August. Mm. And they're all supposed to be done by 30 June. Yep. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's protocols, uh, again, talking about the United States, because they're so litigious, there's protocols there that um, you always have to provide the native file. They call it the native file, which is the original Word document or Excel. So most people now print everything out, make sure there's no footers or headers, so you're not, you're not printing anything on the document, the face of the document, so date printed, or the file path of the document. They then have a PDF, they then scan that, and then they save that PDF to their system, so that there's, there's nothing left. So the ones who are printing, and then get lost. Yeah. There's other standards in the, in the US where you have to be litigation ready. There's an expectation that you're going to be sued. You always have to be ready to be sued. You always have to have your documents available and ready for the index. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't know if this video. This is a video of um, another win that we had. <laughs> this was a uh, corporate secretarial where there was a dispute between uh, business owners, and I think it was. Uh, two spouses, where um, they recorded every meeting and there was then a dispute in the marriage breakdown as to what was said at the meeting as to who was going to get what and how things were operated. And we got the um, corporate secretary's voice recorder and they said, oh no, no, it's all deleted. And we imaged the voice recorder, found all these deleted voice recordings and handed them over. So here you go, here's what you're after. So you can sort of, this is sort of a live action of me doing that. Probably hear me talking actually. I think she turned the sound off. This is a wedding cake. This is This will be anxious.
then if you look at that same device in our, this is our forensic software. So there's the same folders. So that's folder A where those active files were. If you go to folder B, nothing, folder C, nothing, folder C, ah, we've got four deleted files which weren't on there if you just plug it in. So what I do is I, I just say, unerase that to make it not deleted, export it out, out of the image that we have. So it pulls all the bytes off the forensic image that we have and reassembles them into a file, um, which then becomes an active file on my desktop, which you can then play and then you can hear. Uh, don't tell anyone we've got a push recorder and don't tell so that's that's what all that was. Here's what we're going to do. So that's a good win from just a voice recorder. So. <coughs> all right. So that was that. That's a good one. It's just a simple thing to show you. Here's what the computer can see. Here's what we can see, and the metadata of when it was recorded and deleted, so we can verify all that as well. Okay. Um, so we're getting the evidence at the micro micro level from every first bit number one to bit number six billion. So you know what I mean by bit, so the bit on a hard drive. So hard drives are just, even if they're the old style or a new solid state, it's still just ones and zeros. So um, a bit is one of the switches. So the switch is, is the hard drive the pattern is made up of billions of switches that are either on or off. And the computer just reads the ons and the offs and translates that into files and movies that's how it works. So, um, one bit, so uh, four bits, four switches, four bits is a nibble, eight, eight bits is a byte. Uh, I think two bytes is a, there's all these words for it, geeks that love this stuff. Oh, so you've got bits, bytes, <laughs> oh, we can't yeah. kill a byte, so it's a thousand bytes, so a thousand lots of eight. Um, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, Petabyte, petrobyte, uh, what comes after that? There's things like brontobytes now. So there's all these server farms around the world, Singapore, and there's a, there's a massive data center at, uh, I think it's Springfield, or Amon Plains or somewhere. It's what it's, I think they used to say, I don't know if it's still okay, it's the most secure building in Australia, maybe the Southern Hemisphere. It's a data center, it's got its own power that um, can't be switched off. It's got its own, it's Brick. It's got no windows. It's guarded by three separate barbed wire fences, and that's where all the bank data is. Oh, wow. These massive server farms out of Springfield. There's probably newer ones now around the world, but um, yeah. So when your data's in the cloud, it could be at Springfield, or it could be in Hong Kong, Singapore, Seattle. Uh, it moves. Data in the clouds everywhere. Hence, the cloud. Clouds move around the world. Um, so we're preserving. System files, activities, and what's password, especially um, a file that most people have on their computer that's passwords.doc, which has all your passwords in it. And we get that and we jump into all your protected files and grab all those. So that's great. Love that. Um, as I said, the image is, is read only, it's portable, it's no expert, it's secure, and we can verify it back to the original. So we fingerprint uh, the data. And everything can be repeatable for court and supportable by the evidence. So that's a good way. That's why we do it. Actually. With the passwords, what about those programs that, that you only have to know that one and it opens up or gives you random uh, passwords for yep. all other programs? Yep. You have to just make sure that you get that single authority yep. versus. Cause yep. I wouldn't imagine that loads to one of those password files. Would it? No. So you're talking about a, um, a password um, cache of the software? Yeah, an app, password app. Yeah, like yeah. one password, uh, last pass, yeah, those uh, ones. Yeah. all those types of things. Yeah, I've got, I've got one of those. They're great. We'll talk about that later in the session. Okay. Has everyone got one of those? No. Okay. We'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, but the thing is, uh, they all rely on you knowing one password, and that'll be stored somewhere. Right. Okay. Uh, and I've got software as well that will open your Word documents. If, if there's a password on it, we can open them, or a PDF that's protected, we can open all of those. There's, there's people that build. It's always a race who's, a, who's ahead. So it's 
someone will build something that's real secure, and then someone else builds something that will break it. Currently, the baddies are winning um, because there's much higher adoption of the encryption now. And I've been saying this for a long time as well that encryption is probably the biggest um, obstacle that we can get in terms of breaking into files um, because the documents are completely scrambled. And unless you have that key, which is normally a complex encryption key, there's no way you can get it back. And the, and the reason people aren't using encryption, or the reason that people might not use encryption is that if you do forget the password, someone like me or, or anyone is never going to get your stuff done. It, it doesn't matter, it's gone. If that's the only copy you have, it's gone. If you can't remember the password, it's gone. So if you use encryption, really secure, fantastic, but as long as you've got a secure password. But if you forget that password, absolutely gone, irretrievable. And that's why people use it. It's a one way system. It's like a lock. The whole idea of a lock is it's, it's easy one way possible the other way. So if you've got a really secure lock or a, or a bank safe, it's easy just to close the door, spin the wheel, locked. But if you don't know how the combination open, you will never get it open. Easy one way, difficult the other. And that's what encryption is. So metadata is great. We can search by you know, when was it created, when was it deleted. So how can I, uh, how can I protect myself? So Hacking is certainly on the rise. We've all seen, the problem is, hacking was a much bigger problem in the past than we all were told. So there's been massive hacks of things like LinkedIn, Gawker, Spotify, and, and uh, iCloud that we get told about years later. Oh yeah, yeah, we got hacked, sorry. Uh, so there's a huge reliance on, do you know why we're being pushed to the cloud? Now, Cloud was probably booted six or seven years ago and everyone said, oh, it's a disaster. All your personal information on the internet, anyone can get to a disaster. And it sort of went away. But in the last, I reckon, three years, people are now just in the cloud. We pushed it. Back. We understand that our Facebook data is in the cloud. It's out there. Um, we're all using cloud sharing apps. So Google Drive. Does everyone use Dropbox? Anyone use Dropbox? So these are viral apps. They gave it to you. It's like a drug dealer. I gave it to you for free. Here's two gigabytes for free. Have it, George. And, and if you care, someone else in the Dropbox will give you more. Classic drug dealer stuff. <laughs> we'll give you more. You want more? Oh, you fill that up. Oh, you're gonna have to pay. If you want, you know, a terabyte of information on the cloud, you're gonna have to pay. Otherwise, you're stuck with two gigabytes. You happy with that? So they they went viral. <clears throat> so people got all their friends into it to get more storage, and then people started paying to get the big. Fantastic business model. The reason we're being pushed to the cloud is that the thing we want most from our devices, the thing we want most, apart from you know speed, which we expect, is battery life. There's no point in coming up with a device that's the best computer or the best phone if it only goes for half an hour, which um, some iPhones used to back in the day. So we all want the one that we charge once a day. I mean, I remember the outrage. I used to have a Nokia that I charge once a fortnight. When people came out with the iPhone, you had to charge it every day. It was an absolute outrage. Ah, oh, doesn't work. Now we don't care. We just plug it in all the time. But battery life. So the way to get battery life is that you don't have your device um, storing all of the stuff that has to store and maintain, and you need a bigger battery. Um, we want the biggest battery on a device that we can get, which means that if all the processing and storage is done somewhere else, you can fit a bigger battery in your device, and all it has to have is a connection. Most of this stuff is now just an internet connection so that we can have more battery. So all your data is somewhere else. Like Apple Music, all your music's on the cloud. Anyway, uh, right, so that's leading to a theft, an increase in theft of personal information, identity crime, hacking, uh, generating significant profit. Um, so physical security. The big thing used to be lock your letterbox. So you should do the same thing with your computer. Make sure your computer's locked with antivirus and a firewall. Um, Apple strategy is to not let anyone um, put any software on their devices unless they've vetted it. And that's why we have the App Store. Nothing gets on the App Store unless it's been tested and retested by Apple. That's the only way to get an app on here. Um, that's their strategy. Uh, 
antivirus, make sure you're running antivirus, everything's up to date, make sure your operating system is patched, um, regularly change your password. Anyone, does anyone ever change their password? You do? Really? Um, you use a combination of symbols and capital letters and dots? Yeah. yeah. Do you use the same password for everything? You've got different passwords? So some people have a password for banking, password for social media, a password for uh, work. That's a good way to do it. That's dividing that up. But really, you should have a different password for everything. And that limits your exposure. Um, and that's as important as having a complicated password. And limit the use of public Wi Fi. Don't use public Wi Fi for banking. No one would do that, really. Um, the reason being, you can have someone uh, spoofing that free Wi Fi saying, I'm the free Wi Fi, and you're essentially logging into their computer. And then they connect to the free Wi-Fi and they record the traffic. And they have um, sniffers, so they sniff out when you log into your banking. They record your uh, bank address and your login and your password. And then you know they let you merrily do your banking. Then when you log out, they go back in and take all your money. So that's why you don't use that public Wi-Fi. And you're giving away your, your data anyway. Just use it to find the nearest restaurant. Don't, don't use it for banking. So most things are still targeted emails, so clicking on a link. And um, the, the weak spot in any network, I could build you the most secure network in the world for work, for example, but no one would want to work there. So there'd be no USBs, there'd be no emails, there'd just be a server and you, and that's horrible. Um, so the weak link in any in every system is not the computers, it's not the antivirus, it's not the firewall. We link in any system to other people because no matter how many times we say to people, you're going to get an email this week from ASIC that says download your invoice or your client's in trouble or your Australia Post that you've got a delivery, don't click on those. That's a virus. I guarantee you, out of an office of 100, two people would click on it. That will download um, a crypto virus, so it will start encrypting the whole network, and then you're in that Bitcoin situation where you've got to pay money. To get your data back, and it happens all the time. So you can just hover over a link, and if it's supposed to be Australia Post, instead of Australia Post, it says, um, you know, something in Russian. Don't don't click on that link. Don't click on that, or just delete it. If you're in doubt, just delete it and ask your IT guy. Or talk to people say, oh, does this look weird to you? And if it does feel weird, then it is probably uh, this type of thing. So that leads to viruses, <coughs> rootkits. These ransomware and encryption viruses would be probably, because this graph is probably six months old, um, it's obsolete, like anything in computing, this would be near the top now, ransomware and encryption, especially in the last six months. When you download this virus, it starts encrypting all your files and you need that, um, that Bitcoin payment to get them back. We've had clients that that's happened to. So you can either just ignore the virus and just restore from backups everything, or you can pay them. And most clients pay them. And then a month later, they get another warning saying, ah, we've just encrypted your data again. We need another whatever Bitcoin. And Bitcoin used to be like $100 for a Bitcoin. I think currently it's had a massive drop yesterday. It was about $6,000 for a Bitcoin. I think it dropped overnight. It's now like $4,500 for Bitcoin. But it's dropping. Uh, because Bitcoin's open to exploitation and Investors overseas pump it up, they do a massive pump, they dump all their Bitcoin at the six grand, and then everyone's like, it's like any stock. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, data and romance is still huge, especially at that um, user level. We've had clients that have lost tens of thousands of dollars by thinking they're in love. They send their money to the guy in South Africa to get the passport or the, the kidney transplant, and uh, it, does, it, it happens. It absolutely happens. It's probably one of the biggest things. Love scams. Still. still. And they keep lists of suckers. There are sucker lists. They're found on raids. They're found on raids. Um, people that have been, that have fallen for this, are statistically likely to do it again. But people still fall for the Nigerians. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, run the lottery. Yeah, you're in love. I'm in love with this person. Yeah. Yep. Have flown overseas, given 
hut tens, thousands. The biggest one I saw was um, a guy out west, there was a farmer out west who sold the, the mining rights or sold his land to one of the big gas companies. He had all these gas rocks and he'd never really had a partner. He was in his mid 40s and he was cashed up and he spent like $150,000 on two dates to go on two dates with this woman. And there's a woman in Brisbane who's notorious for this. And she's, she's been doing it for years. And she thinks she has no sympathy. She's been to jail, she has no sympathy for them. She comes out and says, well, they're stupid. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So, jobs and investment. Uh, so, threats and extortion is an issue. Right? And recently, how am I going to find That's about. Um, recently, there was one where, it's probably a bit unsavory, but um, it caused a bit of a marriage breakdown because uh, the husband got an email saying, oh, you were on this website, I filmed you through your webcam on your laptop, I've got a video of you on one of these adult websites, uh, I'm going to send that video to everyone in your contact list unless you give me 10 bitcoins or whatever. So he sort of came clean and, uh, and of course that was all rubbish. There was no video, it's not, it's not possible to, to, for someone to record everyone going to a website and create a video. And, uh, uh, so the poor guy came clean needlessly and uh, yeah, he got found out. So that was a threat. Unless you give me money, I will expose you. I'll send this video to everyone. So poor guy. And anyway, <laughs> he just and like it could have been exposed to me. <laughs> well, <laughs> to the webcam. Uh, no, he wasn't. That's the thing. It was all fake. False. It was just like winning the lottery. An email saying you won the lottery is, is the same as an email saying I filmed you on this website. It's fake. They haven't filmed you on the website, it's just a threat. I thought you were going to say that the marriage no. breakdown happened because no, no. he must have been involved. No, no. no he, he had to come up with the cash. No, he had to come up with the cash. He had to come clean and say, I've got to come up with a thousand dollars because I've been filmed on whatever website. <laughs> but if you haven't done it, you wouldn't pay it. Well, you had done it. <laughs> but that's the, your argument is the same as I did have a relative that fought in the Boer War, and his name was John Smith. Ah, oh, I've got a billion dollars. And they write and say, yes. Oh, well, you need to send us a clearance fee of $250. $250. Now we need the government tax of $3,000. Right, now what's happened is it's stuck at the port. We need $45,000. It's a billion dollars. We need $45,000 and you'll have your billion. $45,000. And they just keep going until you stop paying and they go, okay. <laughs> okay. And you hand it over 100 Gs, which as you said, people in the profession are. Hand it over 100 Gs going, wow. I guess my relative in the Boer War didn't leave me a million dollars. I guess there isn't a video of me masturbating on the internet. <laughs> I, got, I got suckered. I got suckered. There you go. Um, so, yeah, it is unfortunate. So, we know what spam is now electronic junk mail. Phishing, so, phishing is sending out um, emails with the click here type thing um, to get you to download the crypto virus. And now there's another one, spear phishing. If you have spear phishing, where it's targeted, where they say uh, so and so's um, the head of a university, or um, and they get background about that person. And it's a targeted attack, so it's spear phishing. They're not just it's not just a shotgun email of trying to get a million people. They're going after a guy saying, "Oh, we've we've done we found out that you've done this and this and this." Um, so. Criminals are using. So we've been through all this. I won't go through it again. That's in your in your notes. I'll just move on for time. Um, denial of service is probably pretty familiar. When we had our last census, denial of service. So a distributed denial of service where they have a bot network. So computers that are already infected, um, and perhaps they're sitting in someone's empty office or around the world in server rooms. They're already infected with the virus, so they've got. A thousand computers or ten thousand computers that they can control. They start the, the denial of service attack and they tell all those computers to hit the website repeatedly with traffic. And that's what happened with the census. So they actually shut down the census for a day or two. And IBM weren't weren't ready for it and they had to settle with the with the Bureau of Statistics because they weren't supposed to lose service. So that's a DDoS attack, denial of service. All right. It's vastly underreported. So people who didn't report their incidents were asked why. The main reasons were, well, who's going to care? Um, the 
probably not going to be able to catch them, and they're probably right, especially with jurisdictional issues. A police sort of say, well, there's not much I can do. A, we don't know where they are. B, if they're in um, Europe or Africa, they're, they're gone. They're, we're never going to find them. Either get a new computer or just don't do it again, and then people do it again. Um, a lot of people just don't know or won't admit. And some people just want to say, oh, look, it would be negative for us as a big medical centre to say that our records have been hacked, so we just won't say anything. Of course, there's new legislation in now that requires people to yep. report right. data hacks. Yep. Yep. Do they? I don't know what data it comes in, but um, it's company responsibility to right. report that now. Is it for the breach? Is it just for public companies or is it for everybody? Or? I, I think it actually goes down lower well than public companies. Because yeah. it did happen to a client of ours, medical <laughs> They, they were, had a, a crypto virus and all their patient records were can't get access. So someone shows up for an appointment, who are you? We can't open your records. Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> it's happened here, it's happened a bit tomorrow. And, and they used to, the crypto viruses are getting smarter and smarter, of course. So they used to start a client folder A and start encrypting from there. So the IT guy would see it happening and pull the plug or some, freeze the server and just restore those folders. Um, they now go in and randomly start encrypting files all over the place. So you, you sort of have to start restoring all your files and it's a huge time cost. Because um, the biologics are the weak link. People clicking on emails and just stuff. Okay, so lots of people get this. Um, the big thing for me is it's still, and again, this is probably six months ago, so obsolete. Um, at least one in three people on social media connect with people they don't know. I can't believe that. As an old person, never met this person, but I'll, I'll give them access to all my photos and I'll tell them when I'm going on holiday and. I'm away for two weeks. Gee, I hope no one breaks into my house. In the photo of me, oh, I'm going for a job. I don't know why they didn't hire me. That type of thing. So, yeah, that's extraordinary. One in 10 have had their profile hacked. That, that would be higher too, I think. Then we've been happy. I'm still waiting for when you to not use them later. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, there's a website you can go to to see if you've been your email address has been included in all of the big hacks of LinkedIn and iCloud and stuff like that. It's, it's called, uh, I can email it to you if you like. It's something like www.haveibeenporned.com um, or something. You put your email address in and say, yes, your email address was in this attack, this attack, this attack, and they have your password. So I'll go through that in a case that. All right, so again, laboring the point. Make sure everything's up to date. The good guys are trying to help you. Make sure your operating system is up to date. Um, make sure your applications are up to date. Make sure you're using antivirus. That's for uh, business type stuff. Um, limit the use of cloud sharing apps. A lot of what I do is theft of intellectual property where people have allowed Dropbox or something in their business and all the files are just leaving the business. As soon as someone gets a better offer, they take all the files and go. Um, so best to limit the use of those. Um, make sure you've got a PIN code on your phone. Be alert. Avoid suspicious email attachments or email significant websites. And again, we say this all the time, but still, uh, it happens. Uh, don't open any email that you're not 100% certain of the source. Keep everything up to date. Yep. Uh, use complex, nonsensical passwords. If you're using a password application, they'll do that for you. I'll generate a password. And most of the good password applications will log in for you as well. So you actually log in through the application. So they're the good ones. So use password manager to generate and store passwords. Um, they retrieve the password and plug it in. You still need to remember the one password to log into the application. And if you don't have that, then again, it's gone. We need that. They store all your passwords as an encrypted file. So if you can't remember that one password, it's over. And again, that's why people aren't using it. But anyway, I use one quite good. Because in IT, I've, I've got something like 276 accounts. So 
clients and for servers and for computers. And there's no way anyone can remember a unique, complicated password for all of those. So password applications are the best way to go. Big thing, massive thing, is use two-factor authentication. Is everybody using two-factor authentication? Yeah, Dan, we are. Okay, so I'm glad you asked. Uh, so there's a code generator. If you just enable it on uh, almost every website now would have it. Facebook, all those types of websites will have it. Um, your internet banking will definitely have it. You enable it and then it will ask you to enter your mobile phone number or a recovery phone number that it can send you a code to. So generally a mobile. And all you have to do is um, log in. It sends you the code. You put the code in. And then you're in. So that stops the case of someone in uh, Europe, Asia, Africa trying to put in, uh, break the door down by they know your bank pass, so they know that there'll be a J Smith at nab.com or a pagan at facebook.com. They know that there will be that identity. They just run billions of characters and letters until they break the door down and bang, they've got your password. But they can't get in if they then send a code to a trusted device that they have to put in as well. And then they can't get in. So it's that first time login, just the first time login. So if you log in from home, code in. If you log in from your phone, code in. If you log in from a mate's place, uh, code in. So your mate can't guess your password if they don't have your phone. So two factors, so password and code, simple. It's not a burden at all. Stops that. If we get stopped as well, if we get a phone that we're trying to image for a client and it says um, we're trying to acquire their email and it says uh, put in the code and we haven't got the phone, then we can't log in. Pretty secure. So, two factor authentication. All right. So, have a unique password, have a different one for each account if you can. By doing that, you're limiting, if you do get breached, you're limiting the breach to just that one account. Really important. All right. So, quick case study. So, this is, have you seen this porn? You know where that came from? Child. So there was a um, a meme about this. Someone once won a big gaming competition or something, and when they won, instead of saying, "Oh, I owned you," they used props. So they own the P beside each other. Oh, you. Yeah. We put in porn. And now that instead of O, so I own you, you've been owned. So that's what I can say. Um, in 2012, uh, a Russian hacker sold 6.4 million usernames and passwords stolen from LinkedIn. We found about all this later on. We did not find. So the passwords were stored with an encrypted, sorry, the identities were stored with an encrypted password. But with enough time, that encrypted password was broken. So if you had LinkedIn in 2012 with a password, they have your password. I can't stress this enough. So if you have never changed your password, or if you use that password for your banking or your home or whatever, they have it. That's so broken. So, but the other thing that came out of this hack was that because they then had all the identities and the passwords, hackers now understand how we generate passwords that they didn't already. So it's generally, one, if it's not one, two, three, four, five, six, it's six, five, four, three, two, one, or it's password or query. So they, so there's one they always try. Computers are now so sophisticated they can try a billion passwords in about a second and a half. Don't, don't get it like that. So people construct password. It's normally a name with an, with a bit of punctuation and then the year you were born or the year, this year. You know, so you know Hong Kong. Information about 2016 or Pagan, you know, 94 or whatever. Is that a bad <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever it is. So, for example, if, if your password is Hong Kong 2016, they can get that in about 0.3 of a millisecond because they run every character instantly. They've got massive GPU computers and they just run things. So that's, that's happened. And would be safe to say if you've got a password and they want to get you in particular, I'll just put it more to it in a day or so and get it. If you're getting, I'm only going to take a day. 
Yeah, if, if you're the low-hanging fruit, like if you're Bill Gates, I can't imagine what that guy's security must be. I, I just couldn't imagine. But yeah, if they want you, they'll get you. But don't make yourself the easy target. Have different passwords. Don't, like if, if your password is the same for everything, then you're opening yourself up. But if, you, if your bank gets hacked, your bank will try and help you. Yeah. But they can't help you if you're then at the same time getting hacked here and hacked there. So, yeah. And as again, if you had LinkedIn in 2012, they have your password. Well, can't stress that enough. Yeah. Do you know how? No, I've, I've had less. I've, um, I was actually in Singapore. I yeah. first landed in Singapore and I had messages coming through the same company for quite a few years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. LinkedIn profile, I didn't know whether it was LinkedIn or Hotmail at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's highly personal. Yeah. 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 And, and it's it's worse than you think, oh that'll never happen to me. No one cares about me. But then you put your your um web your email into that website, have I been porn dot com and you go, Yes, you were hit in this attack, this attack, and they have your password. You can't stress that enough, they have your password. Um so in June two thousand sixteen we found out that in that hack they actually hacked hundred and seventy seven million usernames and passwords. And they were made available online. To sell. So the password list were created, they're available to hackers that can inject them into websites. So iCloud, the, the good one. Um, so on average, people have 26 online accounts, and I'm sure you guys probably have at least that number. Um, but maybe one or two passwords, or three passwords if you're lucky. Um, so that's why the LinkedIn hack is so concerned. So um, it's critical you get a good password manager. Let it generate a new random password for you, or generate your own, as long as you have a system and you keep it up to date. If you catch wind of something, if you if you hear about someone being hacked, so LinkedIn being hacked, don't think, oh, I'm going to figure out my password. No, they will. They absolutely will. Um, and finally, make sure you have multi-factor authentication, two-step verification for your every account. I used to say your most critical account, I now say every account. It's easy, easy to do. We've always got a phone with Um, yep, yeah, and that's pretty much everything I had to say today. Any, any other questions or anything you want to talk about? Um, I've got a matter at the moment where a, a guy's moved or we've only found two so far. Um, it appears that online vetting um, is a good way because they don't have, I think, the responsibility. Yeah. He's going through a recommendation. Yeah. We're not acting for him, but we've come across two betting. Yeah. But unless the betting accounts are in the name of the company that's in liquidation, they mm-hmm. don't have the power to go to that level, which I would have thought, yeah. hey, you're a company director, you should be dragged into. But what what ability is there to search for a person having those? Because I hear it happens in family law too. Yeah. People moving, uh, some of the female client, uh, yeah. the financial planner, and move stuff into online betting yeah. platforms to sort of park the money there until the um, stuff is available. The value add for me there might be simply to, if, if we had access to the computer imaging his computer that he uses all the time, looking at web history and seeing what agencies he's using, we could recover all of that for you. That's not necessarily deleted. He may have cleared his browsing history, so we could try and say, look, he's looking at, um, I don't know the betting website. He's looking at you bet and TAB, and there's, if there's two, there's probably ten. And so we can give you a list of those. Um, try and recover things like his email addresses as well to see what profiles he's using to log in. Because you need an email address and a code to log in, yeah. and try and work with the client to help out there. Basically, trying to tell her things she doesn't already know. She already knows about those ones, but try and get a bigger picture. And I, I mean. Anecdotally, my experience with the betting websites is that they are pretty sensitive to this type of thing and they'll try and be cooperative, in fact, um, as much as they're legally allowed to. Um, and they have a duty to, if they have a reasonable, um, re- if they have a reason to doubt where the funds are coming from. So if someone bets 50 bucks, 100 bucks, generally, and all of a sudden it's tipping in 100 grand, they, they, I think there's a legal obligation that they have to refuse to bet. 
they have reason to suspect that the money's come from either unauthorised sources or money laundering or those types of things. And they'll cooperate. They'll say, well, here's his, here's his ledger. Here's, here's his betting ledger. And you can see a tip in of you know, 20 grand or 50 grand from the mortgage, and it's usually 100 bucks, then yeah, they've got a duty to disclose or to, to act. And while I've had clients that have actually been frozen from their accounts for the sale or under, under our obligation, you just tipped in this much money, we can't bet with you. Because of, you know, gambling responsibility. Yeah, so that could be a way in as well for the sale. This person has used their mortgage without authorization to bet, and I'll go, oh, we don't want any trouble. Because their licenses are so important to them. So, mm. yeah. Can you find it on the other end as well, where it comes from, not necessarily where it comes from? How do you mean? Oh, if it's going to a betting agency, it's got to all come from someone. Well, yeah, yeah. So you'd look at their accounts and see, see where they're banking and, and try and get statements and things like that. But yeah, generally it's trying to get the money back, see where it's gone. In this instance, we've got about 60 bank traces being done because it's not obvious from the statement where, where it's actually going to. And in getting some of those comes back, there was lab breaks Australia and there was some US one. So, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, at the time, they'll park your account too if you're depositing with your non bank. So, I'm sorry, we're not mm -hmm. on this stuff. Is that no. money laundering? Uh, yeah, so they'll yeah. say, so, look, you're not back, so uh, mm -hmm. we're going to park your account as well. Right. So there might be a way to have a look at the notices that have been provided in that. Okay. Not actually asking for the ledger, but any notifications with the association. Okay. In my experience, is that they are reasonably sensitive okay. and they have all sorts of algorithms that, that are running. If they know that people are loading up with money and then only betting on the, you know, the dollar one favourite type thing, they, they don't want their business. They want the people that are going to lose money. Yeah. So they'll kick you out. But yeah. Anything else? No? No worries. You've got my details, so I'm happy to, to, to talk about anything. I get I get 4 million emails a day, so uh, sometimes that's not the best way to reach me. <laughs> I've just looked up I've just emailed up that um, <coughs> privacy amendment in brackets notifiable data breaches act 2017. Um, medical data breaches. Yeah, I think medical centres and I think barristers and people like that. Are, I know that I know the barristers. I think there's a um, not a code of conduct, but there's an obligation for them to um, not let any evidence leave the country. So if you're using cloud data for exchanging evidence and your data centres in Hong Kong or Singapore, then it could be in trouble. Thanks, Thanks for coming, guys. Obviously, didn't go too long.